All right, so let's go ahead and get started. Uh, I'll pull up the announcement slide here in a second. I just wanted to show you something on Blackboard. I'm in student preview mode, so this should be what you see uh, when you look at Blackboard. Um, if you go into old homework assignments, you should see homework assignment number two with the solution, okay? Now, we haven't uh, gotten uh, homework two graded for you yet, so I don't really have any like observations to make because I don't know how you did. They're just not graded yet. So all I'll say is this, is that it's on there, the solution's on there uh, in case you want to review it. My uh, idea or my thought is to get that back to you on Thursday. So on Thursday, what I'm hoping to do is do a little bit of a swap. I give you homework two, you give me homework three. That's sort of what, what I'm planning for that. Um, again, on uh, homework number three, you're not going to get, uh, like you're going to get a solution, right? You know, back is, uh, it's going to pop up as soon as you turn it in. So on homework three, I'm not going to be able to accept anything late because you'll have the solution. So just make sure you get that in uh, on time, okay? One other thing I wanted to show you on course content, um, if you go into the lecture notes, it's something you probably haven't looked at yet, but if you look, we've got the lecture note handouts, we've got supplements, and then there's exam review slides, okay? Um, if you go into the test one review, this tells you what is all on exam one. Now, we're going to do this on Thursday. We're going to, you know, look over this on Thursday, but I just wanted you to let you know it's there, as is the case for all the other exams. So it might be worth a look, uh, but we'll mention that um, in a couple days. Speaking of, let's get through housekeeping for today. All right, so, where, where is it? Okay, so uh, homework number two is currently being graded, uh, but the solution's uh, posted, so you all have that. Um, homework number three, it's due on Thursday. Again, I'm not accepting any late work, and just make sure everybody is aware of the schedule. We do exam review on Thursday, so come prepared, ready to ask questions on the exam. And then we celebrate the following Tuesday. So we have an exam in one week. Okay. Now, just again, so everybody's aware, I mentioned this, I think, last time, but I am not a time cruncher on exams. I'm not the guy who's going to give you a four-hour exam and give you 30 minutes to do it. I don't think that's uh, of any value to you or to me because, A, you do certainly do not have an enjoyable experience, and then I have to grade it when it's all over. So I would rather create a, a, a challenge but a reasonable one. Um, so what I'm getting at is uh, on Thursday, definitely be prepared to ask questions about the exam. But for today, um, homework number three is due on Thursday. So does anybody have any questions on homework number three? Y'all finished it, right? Yeah, yeah. Everybody's like, yeah. Everybody's got that. <laughs> um, in all honesty, you should uh, be able to tackle most of it. Uh, the last problem is indeterminate, which is what we're going to talk about today. Uh, but in all honesty, if you can handle um, uh, indeterminate axial member, member subjected axial loads, I think you can handle this because it's really, really very similar. I've got two example problems that I'm going to do today that honestly I'm suspecting we'll get through pretty quickly because, like I said, they're very similar to, to problems that we've done before. And then if we have time, uh, I'd like to maybe set the stage for discussing geometric properties, but keep in mind that geometric properties will not be on our second exam, or our, our, our on our first exam. Sorry, it'll be on our second exam, but not on our first exam. Our first exam ends right here with indeterminate torsion. So with that, let's get right into it. All right, so we've dealt with uh, indeterminacy in regards to axial loads and now we need to discuss indeterminacy related to torsion and just like with axial loads there's two types of problems that we're going to handle and that's uh, external indeterminacy in other words whenever you have an indeterminate structure uh, because of its boundary conditions or because of uh, what's going on on the outside but then there's also internal indeterminacy what it happens if you have a composite member or a composite shaft um, we're going to do one problem of each so that you're aware of how to handle them. Again, I think you'll find it's pretty straightforward. So let's look at um, example number 14. This is an example of internal indeterminacy. Um, so I have a two and a half inch diameter composite shaft, and so it's made of a two inch diameter solid aluminum shaft surrounded by steel. So we have a 
two inch solid aluminum core and then the outside is surrounded by steel. So we have different uh, G values for each material because remember G is a material property and we have a torque of 1400,000 inch pounds applied to the composite section. Okay? So what we need to do is find the stress in each of the two materials. I guess the first thing I want to make sure uh, to everybody is, or make sure that everybody's aware of is um, is everybody aware that this is in fact an indeterminate problem? In other words, if I apply a torque to this shaft, I'm going to get some response in the aluminum and some response in the steel, but I don't know which is which, okay? All I know is that if I apply a torque to this section, um, maybe there's 9,000 here and 5,000 there, or maybe this is 8,000 and this is 6,000 or whatever. All I know is that it's gonna add up to be 14,000, so I've got too many unknowns, okay? Everybody okay with that? Now, if you've been paying attention to our formulas and to our um, uh, to, to the, uh, yeah, expressions that we've been using in regards to torsion, I want you to try and picture this scenario in, in your head. What value did I not give you on this problem? There's something I didn't tell you on this problem. Picture this shaft in your mind. What are you missing? The length. I didn't tell you how long. You're going to see how we handle that. Uh, spoiler alert, it doesn't matter how long it is, and, and you'll see why. Okay, so let's get right to it. All right. So first off, we know we're applying a torque, and I was going to call it T sub zero, uh, it doesn't really matter what I call it, but it's um, 14,000 inch pounds, okay? Now, let's take a look at our shaft, okay? So, we have this and that, that's about the best image you're going to get. And this dimension is two inches. This dimension is two and a half inches. Okay. Now, if you want some shading or what have you to sort of clarify what's going on, this is aluminum and so its G value is 4 times 10 to the 6 and then this That's steel, and its G value is 12 times 10 to the 6. So far, so good? Okay, so before we start going into the math and, uh, or, or into our equation development, we're, we're going to get into math, um, I have here these two circular shapes. So what can I go ahead and compute right now? J values, right? So let's just go ahead and do that. Let's just get that out of the way. So for the uh, aluminum, I know that G is 4 times 10 to the 6 PSI. Now how am I going to compute J for the aluminum? Well, it's pi over 32 times that inner diameter to the fourth, right? It's the inner, inner component. So that's pi over 32 times 2 inches to the fourth. Somebody got a value on that? Well, we're engineers. Let's get some decimals on this.
1.57 inches to the fourth, right? Okay. So that's the G and the J for the, uh, for the aluminum. For the steel, we have a G value of 12 times 10 to the sixth. What about our J value? How are we going to compute J for the, uh, uh, for the steel? We take pi over 32 times what? There you go. The outer diameter, bless you, the outer diameter to the fourth minus the inner diameter to the fourth. Okay. Pi over 32 times two and a half inches to the fourth minus two inches to the fourth. Now, we got a value on that. 2.26 inches to the fourth. Do I have a second? Everybody okay with that? Okay. Okay. All right. So that's it right off the bat. Just getting our section properties out of the way. Okay. Now, in order to solve this problem, we're going to need to know what is the torque in the uh, aluminum and the torque in the steel. Okay. So. That's two unknowns. We're going to need two equations of equilibrium, uh, or two equa not, uh, not equations of equilibrium, just two equations. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to say equations, okay, and my first equation is going to come from equilibrium. In other words, if I sum the torques and say the sum of torques has to equal zero, I propose that however much torque is in the aluminum plus however much torque is in the steel, they've got to add up to be 14,000, okay? So we'll say torque not. So this, this is equation number one, okay? Everybody okay with that? I think that's pretty straightforward. Now, if our first equation comes from equilibrium, I propose that our second equation comes from compatibility, okay? Now, what is our equation of compatibility going to be for this problem? The phi value. What is phi? Remember? remember? It's the angle of twist, right? In other words, I'm taking this composite shaft, I'm taking it and I'm twisting it, right? So what is that equation of, of compatibility going to be? Like somebody tell me what it is. Come over here. TL over GJ. Okay, so, so TL over GJ, but what about TL over GJ? Because we got a GJ over here and a GJ over there. What can you tell me? That's it right there. Exactly. I propose that our second equation of compatibility is that the angle of twist for the aluminum has got to equal the angle of twist for the steel. That's our second equation. And this is very analogous to what we had when we had a composite axial member. Remember we were taking members and we were yanking on it. We were pulling on both of them. So we said, well, if the Aluminum stretches two inches and the steel stretches two inches. And that's how we figured out how much axial load went in one versus the other. Well, in this case, we're figuring out how much torque goes into each component by recognizing that they both twist the same amount. So, everybody okay with that? All right. Okay. So, at this point, once you've defined this, it is algebra. This is algebra from here on out. So, you can handle this however you want, but ultimately it's going to involve like plugging one equation into another uh, and so on and so forth. So here's what I'm going to do. All right, let's look at equation two. Now what he said is that the TL over GJ is going to equal the TL over GJ, so let's write that out. So I've got T for the aluminum, length for the aluminum, G for the aluminum, J for the aluminum. Has got to equal T for the steel, length for the steel, G for the steel, J for the steel. 
Now, let's look at the denominators. Is there anything in these denominators that we don't know? We know all that, right? We know what the G value is for each material. And we know what the J value is for each material. So that's easy. Okay? What did we say about the lengths? We don't know what the length is, right? But what do we know about this and this? They're the same. So if this is L and this is L, what can I do with them? Cancel it out. It doesn't matter. So I didn't give you the length because you don't need it. It doesn't affect the answer. And that's why, because they're both the same. So that and that can get canceled. Sound good? Now, what I am going to do is this. I'm going to look at this expression right here, and I'm going to replace it with that. Now, how did I do that? We'll look at equation number one. What is T in the steel? It's that minus this. Everybody okay with that? So I'm going to rewrite this equation as T aluminum over, and I'm going to get kind of lazy and just write this as GJ for the aluminum equals T naught minus T aluminum over GJ for the steel. So I'm lazy. I just wanted to write it like that. What do you think? Now what here do we not know? It's just the T and the aluminum, right? Because we know this. This is 14,000. We know that and we know that. So at this point, like I said, it's alphabet soup. So here's what I'm going to do. I am going to uh, take this denominator on the right, this part right here, and I'm going to multiply it over. So uh, let me start up here. So I'm going to write, therefore, T aluminum times... GJ for the steel divided by GJ for the aluminum equals T naught minus T aluminum. Y'all see what I did? I took this and just multiplied it over. So I have GJ over that as a fraction. Is everybody okay with that? Like, is that too much? Okay. All right. If I'm solving for T aluminum, I need to isolate that. That needs to be by itself. So I'm going to add that T aluminum over on the left. So T aluminum, GJST divided by GJAL plus TAL equals T naught. What do you think? What can I do on the left now? Factor it out. There we go. So, factoring that out, plus 1 equals T naught. Sound good? It's not too bad, right? So, therefore, T aluminum equals T naught over GJ steel, GJ aluminum plus one. Is that okay? It's not too bad, right? All right. I'm going to give you all a sec to write this down, and then I'm going to go on over to the next sheet. So, y'all need a sec? That's a great question. Because ultimately, well, ultimately, we're going to need to determine the overall torque in each section. But really, what we're going to need is the extreme fiber stress in each, in each section. We will get to that. We will get to that. Now, I don't think I've introduced that term to you yet, but we've already dealt with it in here. So just bear with me. All right. Everybody good on this? Okay, all right. So let me go on over to the next sheet because I'm running out of room.
So therefore, the torque in the aluminum is T naught. Then we have GJ for the steel divided by GJ for the aluminum plus one. Did I write that down correctly? Yes. Okay, all right. And so that equals, let's do the bottom first. So help me out, what was G for the steel? J for the steel. And then this one was the 4 times 10 to the 6. And this one was, I think it was like 1.57. And that's plus 1. And then up top, 14,000 inch pounds. All right. Now, this formula is a little complicated, so I'm going to make sure that everybody's able to get this answer. So let's take our time. Anybody have an answer? You say 2630.3? 2632.3. Do I have a second on that? Okay. 2632.3. Inch pounds. Is everybody okay with that? Okay. A couple of things to check and see whether or not you're doing this correctly. Okay. First off. That answer is less than 14,000. That makes sense, right? If you're applying 14,000, maybe one's 11, one's three, maybe one's 10, one's four, what have you, but you shouldn't get 86,000. So right off the bat, the value makes sense. Now, let's go ahead. If this is T aluminum, what is T for the steel gonna be? Say it again. Do I have a second on that? Everybody okay with that? Now, remember I said that one could be nine, one could be five, one could be ten, one could be four. But one thing that we did find is that the steel came out bigger. The steel was the bigger one. It wasn't the other way around. Does that make sense? Like, why did the steel come out as the larger value? You remember what I said uh, sort of a little while ago about stiffness being a magnet? Remember that, that in, in structural systems, the strong or the stiffer an element is, it sort of sucks in load like a magnet. Look at the GJ for your steel. You have 12 times 10 to the 6, and you have 2.26 inches to the 4th. Whereas the GJ for the aluminum, the G is a third of that, and the J is, is a good bit smaller. So as a result, the aluminum is accepting less load. Everybody okay with that? So right off the bat, what we could have done is we could have looked at the way I set this up at the beginning. If you look at the GJ value, so here's the GJ for the steel and here's the GJ for the aluminum, we could have peered into the crystal ball and said the torque in the steel is going to be bigger. Okay? Everybody okay with that? So that, that should... I'm, I'm, showing you that so that you have a little bit of a gut feeling as to what you're doing on homeworks and exams and things like that. Sound good? Now, let's go to extreme fiber stress. Now, here's what extreme fiber stress means. Now, remind me, if you have a circle and that's your rho value, then tau as a function of rho is T rho over J, right? And then we know that the maximum stress occurs where? On the outer edge, right? So 
In mechanics, sometimes we refer to that as what's called as the extreme fiber stress. In other words, imagine the, the, these shafts and these pipes being made up as a series of fibers. It's the one that's the way, way out on the outside. Remember, if you have a torsional shaft, the maximum stress is way, way, way on the outside. Sound good? So that, I, if you ever hear that term extreme fiber, that, that's really all that means. It's just the you know, super, super, super tippy, 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 you know, out on the edge. All right, everybody good? So therefore, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to calculate TR over J and determine the, the, shear, the maximum shear stress for each segment. So what is tau max for the aluminum? It is 2632.3 inch pounds. OK. What's our radius? No, well, one inch. Then J is 1.57 inches to the fourth. One thing about this problem, all the units seem to work out. You wouldn't know that unless you write them out, write out your units. So make sure you're expressing that out. That come out to be? 1676. Do I have a second on that? PSI, right? That's a stress. And then for the steel, we have 11376.6 inch pounds. Say it again. 367. Oh, uh, th yeah, thank you. I said 376. I was like, I was like, that's a low stress value. All right. Our radius is from the center all the way to the outside, so that's 1.25 inches. And then this is 2.26. And that comes out to what? Sixty two eighty seven, you said? PSI. So what do you think? That's not too bad, is it? That is a very common mechanics of materials related problem. Okay. Well, that, that's a good question. So the question was, would the extreme fiber stress be only the stress in the steel or the stress in the aluminum? Let me, let me answer it this way. Um, why don't we look at this in terms of factors of safety? Okay? Which material has the greatest factor of safety? Well, you don't know. You don't know because you don't know what the allowable stress is for the aluminum and the allowable stress is for the steel. For all you know, just to, just to throw some numbers out here, for all you know, the allowable shear stress in the steel is something like 20,000 PSI, whereas the allowable shear stress in the aluminum is like 1,800. So while the aluminum might be seeing less stress, it also might be closer to its limit. And you don't know that until you start taking this to the next step and saying, well, let's look at factors of safety. Okay? And so the only way to do that is to have allowable stress values, which, by the way, in practice, you would from, from one of two uh, sources. Either A, you take that material down to the lab and yank it apart and start writing down a stress-strain curve and saying, well, the yield stress is the limit or whatever limit you, ch you choose to pick. So if the yield stress is the limit, you could know that by taking a piece of that material and breaking it. The other way that you would know it is to go off of your specs. So if it's, let's say for you civil engineers, if, it's, uh, if you're using structural steel, well, A36 steel has a documented uh, usable yield stress of 36 KSI and then a usable tensile stress of 58 KSI. And so that's listed in the spec. And then the spec has factors of safety and things like that to, to, to go along with. Um, for you mechanicals, there are similar specs, you know, SAE and all that stuff. So you, you know, you're either going to know that from material testing or from you know, specifications that you follow. So you'll be able to figure that out. So I don't want you to think that, well, you'll, ha you'll have to figure that out. You, you may have to figure that out, but there's processes to do that. It's not just a mystery. So. so what would you stop at 25 and 60 and how much that would 
I'm saying there isn't one answer. I'm saying there's two because there's two materials. If this was one material, if it was just a solid steel shaft, it would be with TR over J for the, for the single shaft. I'm saying there isn't one. I mean, if, if you want to, if, if, you, if you desperately need to pick one, you could go with the steel just because it's the one on the way outside. But what I'm getting at from a materials perspective is if you're just evaluating the shaft and you just look at it single-mindedly and say, I just need one stress value and one check, and you apply a torque to the shaft, you may fail the aluminum before you fail the steel. That's what I'm saying. Even though it's on the inside and it's seeing less torque, the torque doesn't matter. It's the stress that matters. And it's not even so much the stress that matters, it's the comparison of the actual stress to the allowable stress. And so you're going to have a different factor of safety for each component, for the shaft and for the pipe. Everybody okay with that? And that's what really matters, what's your controlling factor of safety. What do you think? It's not too bad, right? Are, are there any other questions? This is good stuff. And this is like like directly applicable stuff for you mechanicals going into like machine element design. This is stuff to know, just right off the bat. And for you civils who never have to do any machine element design ever again, you will do indeterminate stuff in structures. Yes, sir. Let's say hypothetically, let's say that it's a public member mm -hmm. and the, the aluminum for whatever reason might be the most stress efficient way to test the steel. Would you make the test of the basis of the steel to know when the aluminum failed or would you still carry the weight of the aluminum test? That is an excellent question. That's an excellent question. So I'm going to repeat that for the recording. What he was asking is, let's say, you know, hypothetically that the aluminum fails, could you design it so that the, um, uh, could you design it so that the steel could take over and accept the load? The answer is very possibly, okay? That, that happens quite a bit in civil and mechanical engineering. What you're talking about in engineering terms is the concept of redundancy. The idea that if an element fails, that there are other subsequent elements that could take over. And, and I want to give you some, some separate examples for different fields, okay? Let's talk about civil engineers, all right? Um, if you go out and you drive over regular old everyday bridges, okay? Regular old everyday bridges have like a concrete slab and a series of beams under it, okay? Now in the United States, there's uh, pretty much a codified limit that states that when you have a bridge, you know, slab and beams, that you have to use at least four beams, okay? You have to use at least four, okay? The idea is that if one of those beams fails, the rest of them can take over. And it's kind of interesting. I was in Italy about uh, five or six years ago, and I was driving on the Autostrad, and there were two beam bridges everywhere. Like, they use a different philosophy in, in, in Europe. And I'm, I'm, I'm serious. And, and, and in Europe, they, they take the position that the engineer is the one responsible and so they give them a lot more autonomy to design the bridge however they see fit. And from an economics perspective, two beams are cheaper to fabricate than four. It just is what it is. So in Italy, there are two beam bridges everywhere. And the bridge engineer in me was driving over like, you've got to be kidding me, you know, like going nuts. And I'm, you know, everybody can see I'm the, the dork, you know, tourist that's looking at all the two beam bridges. Everybody's like, what's this guy looking at, you know, but uh, that's just me. Um, but, but in all seriousness, uh, in, in America, we just don't do that. Um, in fact, uh, if you ever see, uh, bless you, if you ever see um, uh, bridges where they have trusses, so you have like a, a you know, you have a, a road, you have a truss here and a truss here, you know what I'm talking about? Technically, I mean, first off, in some instances, that really is the most economic choice and you, you don't have an option, you know, like in really longer span structures and what have you. But from a bridge engineering perspective, they consider that fracture critical because if one truss fails, we got problems, right? So um, we deem that bridge, we have a term for it, we call it fracture critical. If that one, if one portion fails, the whole thing comes down. And so in, in America, we subject those bridges to higher inspection frequencies. So we regularly, periodically inspect structures, but if you're fracture critical, the inspection requirements get a little more intense. Does anybody know why we inspect bridges regularly in the United States? No, they're, Well, no, there was a certain bridge that failed. The one in West Virginia? The one about, you know, not the Silver Bridge. When the Silver Bridge failed, there was a lot of people. Mothman did not bring down the bridge. <laughs> What's that? 
thing. It, it was not the Mothman, I promise. Uh, it was a material characteristic. And I, it was a material, the, 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 the material that they used for that bridge, it was sort of destined to fail because the, the material characteristics really weren't applicable for steel, for steel bridge structures. We've talked about that all day. Um, but as a result of that failure, we implemented the National Bridge Inspection Standard. So we inspect bridges periodically because of that failure. So just a piece of history for you. In mechanical engineering, we do stuff like that all the time where we install sort of mechanical, we call them fuses in, in systems, um, where if the, if, you know, we design the element to fail. Like, why do you put a fuse box in a house? Like, why do you have a fuse panel or a breaker box? Like, why? Yeah, and, and if you didn't have that breaker box, what would happen to your house if you had an overload? It would burn it down, right? So you, so from an engineering perspective, you're installing an element in a system that's purpose is to fail. You know what I mean? Now, as an engineer, you're like, that doesn't, no, no, we don't want things to, sometimes it's going to happen, you know? When you, uh, nowadays in modern automobile design, you install certain components of the frame, and I use frame because that's a little iffy nowadays, but you install certain components of the frame that are meant to plastify, that are meant to absorb that energy so that they, they fail before the, uh, um, uh, before the rest of the car does. Because in a car crash, those, those fuses, those, those uh, structural fuses absorb so much energy so that you don't absorb that energy. Because if you absorb that energy, you'd be having a bad day. So exact, uh, that's another example of it. Um, in, in earthquake engineering, uh, one of the things that we do in, and I'm going back to civil, I apologize, most of my anecdotal examples are going to be related to that. But in civil engineering, and particularly when you're designing buildings, um, when an earthquake hits a building, there, are, there is so much force on the building, you are going to have failures. Like, there's no way around it, okay? You, there's no way to design a building to act like a rubber band during an earthquake and just respond elastically. Not going to happen, okay? The forces are just too extreme. So you have to choose elements that are going to fail, okay? Now, I propose there are three, three, ways that you, there are three places that you can choose. You can choose the columns to fail, which is bad because the building is held up by columns. And if the columns fail, the building's falling down. That's no good. You could choose the region where the beams and columns connect, like that little region there, but it's the same problem. So the only thing that you can do is ensure that the beams fail. I mean, if the beams fail, if, we, if you have a few beams fail in a building, yeah, it sucks, but the whole building isn't coming down, okay? And so one of the ways that we force the beams to fail is we actually, like, and there's a number of different ways that we do this, but we actually cut out pieces of the beam. There's, a, there's like, a, it, we, it's called a reduced beam section, or sometimes you'll hear it called a dog bone section. I'm going to pull an image up just because I could go on about this, and we have plenty of time today, so. Hold on. We're learning. So I know this is a computer model, but this will give you kind of an idea. They actually cut a, a portion out of the beam, and so they force failure there. So that, that section will sort of plastify, and it sort of acts like, like a hinge, but the whole building doesn't fall down. So short answer is, yeah, we do that quite a bit. And you could easily design a problem like this where th think about this problem, okay? Let's say that the aluminum suddenly fails. From a mathematics perspective, then what happens is instead of uh, let's let's go back to the problem just so you're aware. From a mathematics perspective, instead of um, this being 2632 and this being 11 something, this would be zero and this would be 14,000. So you could easily do an analysis and say if the this was gone, what would be the stress in the steel? And just do TR over J with that being 14,000. This would bump up a little bit, and so you could handle it. You see what I mean? So by throwing that aluminum in there, you might be saving some money because aluminum's cheaper than steel. And if the aluminum fails, it would still be all right. Maybe not as desirable, but wouldn't kill people. I talk about this stuff all day. But any other questions? This is good stuff. We talk about dynamics too. Can we? No, no, there we go. There we go. I'm gonna get some chuckles out of you. It's gonna happen. All right. Okay, at some point, we got, we got, let's, let's move on to our next one. Now, this one's going to be very similar um, to some of the external indeterminacy problems, okay? So, 
Uh, well, it's not some. It is an external indeterminate structure. Now, what I've given you is lengths and g values and diameters. So, if I, if you've got diameters right off the bat, you should do what? Compute your j value, like because I've given you a diameter of two inches for the steel and three inches for the aluminum. You can just go ahead and compute that right now. Now, this one is different in that it's not an internal indeterminacy problem. In other words, if I apply a torque here, it's not like a composite member line that, that angle of twist is going to be the same. Our equation of compatibility is a little different. Okay, um, But let's see if we can write some of these equations of uh, equilibrium and compatibility. Let's start off with an equation of equilibrium. Can anybody look at this structure and tell me what would the equation of equilibrium be? In other words, if I sum torque, say so the sum of torques has to be equal to zero, what's the equal, equation of equilibrium going to be? There you go, exactly. That whatever TA is and whatever TB is, they have to add up to be T naught. Now, I, I'm, it could be 7,000 and 3,000 or 6,000 and 4,000, but that's where the equilibrium comes into play. That this plus this has to be T naught. So that's my equation of equilibrium. Okay? Now, what's my equation of compatibility? Well, it's not as simple as the last problem because we knew that if we were going to take it and twist it, that that's, those two angle of twists are going to be the same. But this one is a lot like uh, some of those uh, axial members that we did. So I'm going to sort of help you out with the equation of compatibility. What is the angle of twist at B on this problem? Zero. There's your equation of compatibility that the angle of twist at B is zero. We could easily choose the angle of twist at A equals zero. There's no magic behind that, but that's what I'm saying. Okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to do this problem in two different lights. We're going to remove the support at B and allow B to twist. So let's say it twists 20 degrees. Then we're going to figure out well how much torque would, is required to twist it back 20 degrees the other way, and there's your reaction TB. And if you know what TB is, take T naught, subtract TB, and you got TA. Okay. That makes sense. So once you understand that, the rest is I, it's just grunt work. It's it's gonna like if you understand that, this problem might actually be pretty boring, and that's actually kind of a good thing because then you know what you're doing. So yeah, if, if it's almost like instructional analysis. If you're doing a truss and it's so easy that you get bored, then I did my job because then you know how to do it. All right, here let me let me do this. Let me start a new sheet. And then I saw some folks writing it down. Do y'all need a second? I can wait up here. I said you have a second, so we're done. Everybody good? Okay, all right. <coughs> so right off the bat, the first thing I'm going to do is go ahead and start to compute some properties and just make sure we have all that written down. Um, give me one sec. Uh, let me turn, turn over here. Okay. All right. So... What might actually be a good idea is to maybe put yourself a little table together. All right. And say uh, property. And we have shaft AC and shaft CD or CB. Okay, and let's just take this one at a time. Okay, so G value. Now, what are the units for G presented in the problem? Is it PSI? So, what was the G value for the shaft AC? What was that? Four. 
And then this was 4 times 10 to the 6 PSI, right? Okay. What about the length? What were the lengths given in? Feet, but that's not going to work in terms of units, so why don't we go ahead and convert that to inches. So what were the lengths of these two shafts? 36 inches and 72 inches. All right. Now, we were given diameters, but help me out. Were these pipes or were they solid shafts? They were both solid shafts, right? So if they're both solid shafts, then what's the J value? The J value in inches to the fourth, remember, J for a shaft is uh, pi D to the fourth over 32. So let's just go ahead and chug that out. One point five seven and this one. Seven point nine five. All right. Yes, yeah, so, I mean like right off the bat, just compute these. Because it's simple, it's straightforward, and you know you're gonna need them. And so just put them in a little table, make it a little easier on yourself. All right. Now our equations. Okay, so our first one is based off of equilibrium. Okay, so we know that if we sum torques, we know that TA plus TB is T naught, which in this case T naught was 10,000 inch pounds. And for two, we have compatibility. In this case, compatibility, we know that the angle of twist at B is zero. Okay? Everybody okay with that? All right. So we'll call this equation one and call this equation two. Okay, so how do we go about this? Well, we can't just plug and chug, because if we plug and chug, we know that this is zero, and TL over GJ, if we start plugging in, we'll get that zero, and, and that's not correct, okay? The reason why is we have to do a little bit of a redundancy analysis, okay? So here's what we're going to do, all right? So we're going to say step one, assume... B is free to rotate. Okay? So, let's just bring up the problem, make sure we're all clear on what's going on. So, they're both fixed, right? What I'm going to do is I'm going to take that fixity at B and throw it in the trash. So, if I apply a torque at C, B is going to freely rotate. Let's say it rotates 20 degrees. So it's going to freely rotate 20 degrees this way. What I want to do is I want to determine what is that 20 degrees. Probably not 20 degrees, probably something else. But let's figure out exactly what it is. So we need to figure out that. Okay? So if I draw that out, here's what I've got going on. Here's the shaft. All right, so here's the shaft. Oh, I can do better than that. That's T naught. That's A, that's B, and that's C. Oh, no, nope, I got that backwards. This is C, and that's B. There we go. And that's my segment, okay? Now, here's what I propose. We want to determine the angle of twist at B. 
Well, I propose that that's the angle of twist from A to C plus whatever the angle of twist is from C to B. In other words, just add them up, just like we've done in previous problems. Is everybody okay with that? So in order to do that, we're going to need a TL over GJ here and a TL over GJ there. We know the L's and the G's and the J's everywhere, right? All we need to do is figure out the torques, okay? So how do you do this? Samurai swords and lightsabers, right? Okay. So if I samurai or lightsaber through these sections, what do I have? Let's start off with this CB. If I cut a section and look to the right, how much torque is in this segment over here? Let me go, let me go back to the original image because I think the original image draws it a whole hell of a lot better than I can. All right. Here's this segment, and I'm grabbing here and I'm twisting it. Now, keep in mind, that's gone. How much, how much am I twisting this segment right here? What's that? Well, th th think about it like this. This is holding me back, right? So imagine, like, what's it? Imagine I'm holding this pen, right? Okay, I'm holding this pen, and I grab and I twist. I'm asking how much torque is in this segment right here. Like, how much is this segment being twisted? Well, hold on, hold on, hold on. Well, I took the pen. I, I wish I had brought my little, uh, my little, little beam with me. Okay, first off, let's just, let's just look at this. Would you agree that in this scenario, this reaction is T naught? Would you agree with that? Okay, now we got two sections to cut. Section one and section two. All right, now let's cut a section. Section one, look to the right. I'm saying cut a section, look to the right. Here's what you've got. How much torque is inside that segment? Zero. That's what I'm saying. I'm saying that if you grab this guy's pen, and you twist it like this, right? This, this hand is holding it back, right? So I'm actually torquing this left portion of it. But the right portion of it ain't seen anything. It's just going along for the ride. Is it rotating? Yeah, it's rotating, but it's not being twisted. It's not being wrenched on. It's just like connected onto it. It's just going along for the ride. Does that make sense? Everybody okay with that? Here, here's what I'm getting at. I'm getting at this. I'm getting that the torque inside segment CB is zero, and the torque inside segment AC is that. That's what I'm getting at. Because if I cut a section here and look to the right, that's torque CB. I can just look at that and see that it's zero. If I look at section 2-2, two, two, I've got this going on, T naught, and then this responds. So this is torque AC. Is everybody okay with that? Is that a little weird or is that good? Okay, all right. So if that's the case, would you agree that I could do that? Like it's going to twist, but it's not going to twist any more than the other segment. It's just going to go along for the ride. So really to compute this, it's just the torque in AC times the length of AC over the G of AC and the J of AC. Everybody okay with that? So I've got 10,000 inch pounds times, now this is where our table comes into play. The length of AC was what? 36 inches? 
G was 12 times 10 to the 6, and J is 1.57 inches to the 4th. What does that come out to be? Remember, it's going to be tiny. 0 0.019. What are the, first off, does anybody have a second on that? And what are the units on that? Radian. So it is going to be tiny. That's okay. Now, just for the sake of discussion, what is that in degrees? You got a calculator? What are you? It's sitting right next to you. There's my. One point oh nine, you said? One point oh nine, and that's degrees. Okay. So I propose that if you remove that fixity at point B, that point B is going to rotate. It's going to rotate about one point oh nine degrees. So now what we need to do is figure out how much torque at B will bring it back one point oh nine degrees. Is everybody okay with that? And so this is sort of an indirect way of applying equation two, if you will. So, there we go. Does everybody have this? Like, can I go ahead and move on to the next sheet, or do you need a second? Okay. So, step two. How much much, much torque at B will cause that. Okay. So here's what we've got for our second situation. We've got this. So remember, when we do this, we don't put any of the other loads on it because we've already considered those. All we consider is this. We have a torque being applied at, at B, and we say, how much is necessary, how much torque is necessary to cause 1.09 degrees in rotation? Everybody okay with that? So originally, it was rotating this way with that load on it. So how much additional load is required to bring it back. Sound good? So let me ask you this. This is, so let me label my points. This is point A, this is point C, point B. We handle this the same way. We cut a section, cut a section. Alright? If I cut a section in either of those segments and look either to the left or to the right, it doesn't matter, what's the torque going to be? What's whatever TB is, right? I don't know what TB is because we've got to figure that out. But if I cut a section here, look to the right, all I see is TB, right? If I cut a section here, look to the right, all I see is TB. So for this analysis, I'm going to say that TAC is TB and TCB is TB. So before we had one of them was zero. That's not the case here. So when we compute our angle of rotation, last time how we were able to zero one of them out, we can't do that on this, can we? Because one of them isn't zero. Is everybody okay with that? Okay. All right. So, if you're okay with that, then unfortunately we got to do a little bit of plugging and chugging and a little bit of algebra. Let's see how that works. Okay. 
So the angle at B is I'm getting ahead of myself. Plus this. Just expressing it out, right? Now, first off, I know the equations look a little nasty, but would you agree that the L's, the G's, and the J's, we know what all those are. Like those are just properties of the shafts and we already have those computed, okay? What about the torques? These two are the same, aren't they, in this scenario? Bless you. So can I factor that out? So let's factor that out. So instead of TAC uh, and TCB, let's just call it TB. Right? Here's my point. Would you agree that we know everything inside those parentheses? We don't know the TB. But do we know this? That's 1.09 degrees, right? But let's be careful. I'm not going to put 1.09 degrees. I'm going to put that. I'm going to put radians. Because remember, plugging and chugging, that's going to come out in radians. Is everybody okay with that? So at this point, it's a pretty long formula, but it's just that, a formula. So therefore, TB is the following. And now it's time to just plug and chug. So 0 0.019 radians. And okay, what do we got? So this was, let's see. Y'all need to help me out. What was the G and J for AC? Like what was the G for AC? So this was 12 times 10 to the 6. What about the J? Was that the 1.57? 1 1.57 inches to the fourth. Now the length, that was 36, right? All right. And then this was 4 times 10 to the six, right? And then the J, it was like 7 something, right? What was it? 7.95. And then what was L? 72? The little table helps, doesn't it? So plug and chug and what do you get for TB? Forty-five sixty-two. Do I have a second on that? Forty-five fifty. Uh-oh, engineering challenge. Forty-five fifty-one. Are, are we in agreement? Okay. All right. So if that's TB, what's TA?
5449 is that I did did you do that right It's not too bad right all you got to do is figure out you know what was your angle of twist with the support gone and then how much torque will bring it back that's all there is to it okay so once you have that you can then determine the maximum stress pretty easily okay so therefore maximum shear stress remember tau max is TR over J or TD over 2J just diameter over 2 so therefore the maximum stress in the first segment is just that first torque. And then for the second one, it's just the second, you know, accordingly. So somebody got some values for me, or do you want me to plug and check that out, or you think you can tell me? So we got the 5449, the diameter of the first shaft, too, and then J for the first shaft, and then so on and so forth. For the first one? 3471. Do I have a second on that? Yep. Okay, 3471. What are the units? But you said 3471 for this one? I got like 2913. Hold on. Let's let's make sure we're plugging in the right values. Maybe I, maybe I got a mistake. So 5449 inch pounds times 2 inches over 2 times 1.57. And you got, say it again. All right. I must have an error on mine. All right. And then the second one. So this is 4551. Three inches over two times seven point nine five. What'd you get here? Eight hundred and fifty nine. Do I have a second on that? All right. I must have like a like a units issue or something in there. I don't know. Let me check that out. Oh, well. Okay. All right. Are there any questions about any of this? Well, here's the thing. This, that's exam one. Everything from day one up until this point right here is exam one. Everything moving forward is the rest. So I, I, I know that you, I, some of you might go, oh, I'm not going to pay attention to anything after this point for the rest of the day. I get that. I'm not going to do any math for you. I, I, I've been around. I know how things go. But I do want to at least mention what's coming next so that you're aware because um, what's coming next is in a roundabout way going to envelop our discussion of beams, okay? And beams are going to comprise a lot of what we do over the next few weeks. Um, we're going to start our discussion with beams by looking at some geometric properties. And I, I just want to just highlight what's coming. Like, I don't, I'm not going to go into any math because I know you all, uh, A, 
um, you'd be thinking about your first exam and B. I know you got some, some, you know, you're excited for your next course, so your next class. So, um, <laughs> I, but I do want to mention something. Um, we are going to be talking first when we get after uh, when we after the exam. The first thing that we're going to be talking about is geometric properties. And you all have seen this stuff before. I'm going to represent it in a little bit of a different manner. But here's why we talk about this. Okay, I would argue that there are four fundamental formulas of stress that we will explore in this course. We've already seen two of them, okay? Two of them being the formula for axial stress and the formula for torsional stress. Uh, axial stress being P over A and then TR over J. We have seen this, okay? Um, the other two in the middle you haven't seen yet, but one thing you will notice is that your stress formulas are really a function of two things. They're a function of the loads that you apply to the system, whether it's a torsion, a shear, a moment, what have you, some load, and then section properties. You have an A value, you have a J value, you have an I value, the Q. Those are all properties of areas, okay? In other words, if I samurai sword or lightsaber through the section, what does it look like? And how can I express that numerically? That's what, all, like, a lot of the stuff that we do in this class is a sort of goes back to that. So, like, once we get finished with our first exam, this is where we're going to start. We're going to go back to this. And what that means is talking about areas and talking about uh, centroids and, and, and stuff that you probably haven't seen for a while, but we use that ultimately to define what's called a moment of inertia. Now, I believe you all probably heard of or seen moments of inertia, maybe. Like, it might have been discussed at the very end of statics. Usually that's, that's when it's discussed. So it's easy to forget. But for us, it's very, very important. And, and here's why. I'm, I'm skipping ahead throughout my slides. We're going to be discussing this in great detail later. One of the big reasons is because of this. Have you ever seen, like, floor beams in a, in a floor system or, like, joists on a deck or something? Why are they oriented up and down? Like, why do you place the I-beam or the, the, the wooden beams? Why do you place them? vertically. Why don't you place them horizontally? Because they're stronger in that direction. Okay. Now, it doesn't take a, you know, any math to figure that out. Go bend one and you'll see. It's more stiff this way than it is this way. But why? Like, that doesn't, like that's great and everything, but why? The reason why is because if you compute the section's moment of inertia, you will find it is a larger moment of inertia in this direction than it is in this direction. See, one big theme that we're going to be discussing over the next couple weeks after our exam is orientation. See, that didn't really matter for axial loads. See, if I have a member and I yank on it, it doesn't matter if the member is facing like that or if I turn it around and facing like that. I'm still yanking on it. It's still P over A. But with bending, that orientation matters. And how you bend it and in which direction that you bend it changes not only its, its flexural response, but it changes the stresses. So its orientation would even change how you design it. In other words, if you were to design this deck with beams oriented like that in the weak direction, you would need more beams because they wouldn't respond as well. So that orientation affects what we do as engineers. Okay? Now we're going to uh, start by looking at moments of inertia and section properties. I'm going to skip all of this because we will discuss this in very significant detail. Um, let me get past all this. Okay. Um, the reason why that's important is because what we're going to do is we're going to combine that knowledge with another fundamental analysis tool. I know my structural analysis folks are getting, getting used to this, and that's shear and moment diagrams. Because if you understand orientation and you understand section properties and you combine that with shear diagrams and moment diagrams, what you can then produce are stresses on beams. And whether you're a civil engineer or a mechanical engineer, you're going to be designing systems with things in it that are being bent. I don't care who you are or what you're doing. That's going to happen. And so being able to understand flexural stresses is probably one of the most important things that an engineer needs to be able to do. So it's not something that we're going to discuss in a day or two days. It's going to take a little while. So your second exam is beams, and that's it, okay? So I want it to be its own thing. Your first exam axial loads and torsion, and the, the fundamental basic stress stuff that we talk about. One thing I will mention, your exam is complete. I've made it. I did the exam. It took me about 20 minutes. If it takes me 20 minutes, I use a rule of three. 
you all should be able to do it in an hour, at least hour and a half, something like that. Now, one thing I will mention while I'm thinking about it, um, how, what time is it? How much time I got? 9.15, I'll say this one thing. When I start my exams, I start them at 8 o'clock on the dot, right on the dot. But if it's 7.55 and every single person that is in this class that is supposed to be here for the exam is here, I will start the exam early. But that's if everybody's here. So if everybody's here 10 minutes early, and you're the person who walks in at 8 o'clock, people are going to be boring a hole through you. So they'll do that. What are you doing tomorrow, or what are you doing Thursday? You're doing two things for me. What's the first thing? Turn in the homework. What else are you doing? Coming prepared to ask questions. Go through the exam review slides. Take a look at it. I'll see you on Thursday.